from MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. I'm Jonathan Amberian in Helena. On Monday, prosecutors in the Lloyd Barris case took their opportunity to argue about his mental state at the time of the death of Deputy Mason Moore. I'm Casey Conlin in Broadview, one of many Class C towns that say the mandatory shot clock coming to high school basketball could be a huge cost to them. That story coming up. Good morning, Southwest Montana. 6.30 now. The roads are looking a little shiny as the snow mm -hmm. has fallen. Just in time for that morning commute. Uh, <laughs> and we talked about it yesterday that it would be more of a problem for the morning than it would be for last night. And I think for the most part that is holding true. Uh, the snow is still falling here on the weather patio. The temperatures are cold enough that ice is a problem. I have not seen a ton of accidents, uh, to be quite honest, but we do have snow and ice on Bozeman Pass, Homestake Pass, scattered snow and ice down the canyon uh, on 191 between Big Sky and Bozeman. We're really on the tail end of this, and I expect to see that sun poking out as you go through the mid-morning. There may be some patchy fog uh, areas to deal with at times for the morning, but uh, it looks like things are trying to improve uh, pretty quickly through the afternoon. Daytime highs near the 30-degree mark. We're not quite done with the snow potential this week. I'll talk about that next potential and what to expect for the weekend. That's coming up in just a few minutes. Awesome. See you in a bit. Well, on to a story that we've been covering for years. Yesterday, a judge resumed a hearing on the mental state of the man convicted in the killing of a Broadwater County deputy. MTN's Jonathan Imberian reports the testimony focused on what role Lloyd Barris's condition played in his actions. When testimony continued Monday to determine whether Lloyd Barris was guilty but mentally ill in the 2017 death of Deputy Mason Moore, prosecutors brought in an expert to argue he did have the capacity to understand the criminality of what he did. The witness was Dr. Alan Newman, a consulting psychiatrist from California, brought in to evaluate Barris. State law says a person can be found guilty but mentally ill if they have a condition that means they were unable to, quote, appreciate the criminality of their actions or conform their behavior to the law. Newman agreed with other doctors who diagnosed Barris with a delusional disorder, but he said his extreme delusions were separate from his anti-government attitudes. Barris and his son Marshall refused to pull over when Moore attempted a traffic stop. Prosecutors believe Marshall Barris shot Moore, then the men returned to his vehicle and Marshall fired more than a dozen more times. The two led officers on another chase for nearly 150 miles. Marshall Barris was then killed in a shootout with officers. Newman suggested Lloyd Barris's actions were driven by wanting to avoid capture and keep his son out of jail. In most cases that I've seen, when people flee from law enforcement, they know that the reason they're fleeing from law enforcement is, is that they're going to get caught, captured, and arrested by law enforcement. Newman also said Barris later surrendered to police when he could have continued resisting, and he appeared cooperative with officials in the days after, so he showed he could conform in some cases. How is he able to go from going 100 miles an hour to surrendering? Well, the non-psychotic interpretation of that is he's surrendered. It's over. And when somebody surrenders, now they are conforming their conduct and their requirements to the law. But defense attorneys claim Barris's behavior was more likely explained by an acute episode of his mental illness and a years-long paranoia that the government was persecuting him. Last week, the defense presented their own expert, a Montana State Hospital psychiatrist, who said Barris's disorder robbed him of the capacity to understand or conform with the law. Judge Kathy Seeley will have the final determination on whether Barris is eligible for a guilty but mentally ill finding, and that could determine whether he's sent to prison or to the state hospital. But Seeley isn't expected to make an immediate decision. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. And it has taken nearly five years to get to this point. Broadwater County Deputy Mason Moore was fatally shot on May 6, 2017. In June of 2018, Judge Kathy Seeley ordered Bears committed after he was found unfit to stand trial after he, after he was diagnosed with a number of mental disorders. In December of 2018, the state went back to court to determine if Bears could be 
forcibly medicated to get him to a point where he could stand trial. In May of 2019, almost two years after Deputy Moore's killing, Judge Seeley ordered Barris to comply with treatment. Doctors said in September of 2020, treatment had gotten Barris to a point where he could stand trial, and Judge Seeley ruled a trial could proceed. That trial was ordered to be moved to view in October of 2020, but it would be almost a year before the case went before a jury. Then after a trial that lasted almost two weeks, Barris was found guilty of delivering homicide by accountability and other felonies on September 21st of 2021. Well, some big changes are coming to high school basketball in Montana. Last week, the Montana High School Association voted to add a shot clock starting next year. Some of Montana's largest school districts are excited about the change, saying it will improve the on-court product. But as MTN's Casey Conlon tells us, it'll be a big burden for some of the state's smallest schools. Shouts of excitement rang out across Montana when the MHSA announced a shot clock is officially coming to high school basketball starting next season. But the mood in Class C towns like this one here in Broadview, not nearly as jubilant. In fact, much more concerned about the cost this mandatory measure will incur. Now we had another job, um, I'm never going to find them. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Broadview Athletic Director Kim Sorkness DeCock is already worried about having to find another basketball savvy volunteer for next season's games. It's a challenge to find people to keep the book, keep the clock, take tickets. You know, I think it's harder operationally to run a, sh a, a shot clock than it is a game clock. And so, you know, how many stoppages a player they're going to be to try to reset the shot clock. And that's just the human cost. Then there's the cost cost. The basic one we have to have in our gym is going to be around $4,000. Some of the other schools that don't have as updated of uh, clocks as we do will have to buy the whole system. It's going to cost them $20,000. That money will come from most schools' general funds, the money given to them by the state to cover all generic expenses. Supplies, things that we need in the classroom, desks, chairs, those kinds of things. So yes, it's going to take away some of that. So far, Sorkness DeCox says she hasn't heard any additional help coming from the state or MHSA to offset those costs. Even School District 2 Athletic Director Mark Wall, who oversees the largest district in the state, tells Q2, quote, it will be somewhat expensive to install four sets of clocks and that they'll even need to look into sponsorships. It's one of the reasons Scott Severance, Broadview Lavina's varsity boys coach, has been against the shot clock for a while. I guess what I've always questioned with it, is this a good use of resources or is there a better way to use them or utilize them to enhance the experience for, for kids and players? I think the intent or the idea behind it is to improve play, but initially at least until there's an adjustment to it, I think the style of play or the quality of play is going to actually go down. Time will tell just how steep the learning curve will be. Casey Conlon, MTN News.